podium, I always try to keep in mind that it's not about me, it's about you all, and I want you to take away some transferable sales ideas. Oftentimes when we're speaking, or we're going to a meeting, a two-day meeting, we just got back from a meeting, my partners and I, and uh, we start off, we make a list of 12, we, we number one through 12 on a piece of paper. Every time an idea hits us that we want to capture, we write it down. After we've got 12 ideas and we've called them down to 12, we go back and say, okay, what are the three key ideas that I really want to take with me and keep with me? And then finally we say, what is the one idea that I'm going to implement when I get back to the office? So this morning when I go back to my office, we're going to have a lunch meeting with our whole team and we're going to convey to them the three and the one. So hopefully, I don't know if I'll have 12 things I can get you all to write down, but hopefully have at least three and zero in on one of them. So the first thing I want to talk about is what Rogers mentioned about the uh, people and, and working with clients. And one of the things I learned early, early on in my career, and I've been doing this for 40 years, is what Teddy Roosevelt said, and that is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's so true, especially in the life insurance business. When I started, I was so maybe almost self-conscious about being an insurance agent that I wanted to overcome that. So I learned a lot, I read a lot, and I studied a lot, I got a lot of designations, and I was really trying to impress people with how much I knew. And the reality is they don't care how much you know about real estate, how much you know about different parts of town, until they know how much you care about them and what's going on in their lives. Also early on, I, I started reading, and Roger says we all do things differently. I did a lot of reading. I know Rogers probably hasn't read a book since college. <laughs> well, usually you say that. Yeah. So it's, but it's just the way we, we operate different. I also do a lot of audio books. When I really want to absorb something, I buy the audio book and I buy the book. And I listen and read at the same time. There's a book I want to share with you called Crucial Conversations that is a terrific reminder of when you get involved in a conversation where emotions are high, there's a lot at stake, and it's a great way of going through and talking about whether it's personal or business. And that was one of the books that I bought hard copy and I also listened to the audio book because then you have all your senses involved. You're hearing, you're seeing, you're engaging, and you can read a lot, you can listen a lot faster than you can read. So you can speed up audio books, most of you know that. You can speed up an audio book to two times with some cases and still understand what they're saying and read along in the book. So that's just one thing. So Simon Sinek is one of the ones that I'm sure, how many of you have heard of Simon Sinek? Okay, what's he, what's he famous for? What's his big phrase? Why. Why before how, right? He's got a great TED talk. He's got a book. The book is called Why Before How. And he talks about the fact that if you think of a target, in the center of the target is why, outside that is how, and the third perimeter is what. And he says what most of us do when we engage in a conversation is we talk about what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. And his whole point is why before how? Reverse it. You know, why do you do what you do? When you're working with your customers, why are they looking for a home? What are they looking for? Not how are you going to show them or what are you going to show them? The simplest way I think of saying that is focus on your objectives before your options. So many people look at homes, for example, look at one home in this part of town, another home in this part of town, they're priced differently, one is bigger but it's less expensive because it's in a different part of town. And you can really get your customers really confused in looking at so many different options they don't know what to do. They throw up their hands and don't do, don't do anything. So if you spend time getting them to focus on exactly what they're looking for, what size home, what budget, how many bedrooms, do they want a big yard, focus on those things first instead of running around and showing them homes because you've got a lot of options for them to look at. So. And that, that, that applies to, we use that a lot in concept when we're talking about our clients and making sure that we're not throwing too many options in front of them before we're clear on, our, on their objectives. And our firm is C3 Financial Partners. And just quickly, that with the reason we named it that is because we have found most people don't continue planning, insurance planning, estate planning, business planning for three reasons. First of all, they don't have clarity of their goals and objectives. Secondly, they don't have confidence in what they've, been done, what they've done or what they've been advised to do. And the third thing we find is they think of their planning as an event. I did my insurance trust, I did my wills, it's done. But the reality is things change, and so we emphasize the process needs to be coordinated. So we use clarity, confidence, and coordination as our little mantra. But we've used that for years, but we, haven't, we have not used it as often as we should. So we just put it in the name. And now, what do you think people ask us the first time we give them our card? What's C3 stand for? So it's just a great way of, well, 
permission marketing. How many are familiar with Seth Godin? Okay, what, what's, what's, he, no, 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 that's all right, thanks. Um, what, what is he known for? Prolific writing. Yeah, prolific writing, but a lot of permission marketing, right? Purple cow, Icarus effect. Um, it, it's, it's really the concept of, like my wife says when she, when I ask her opinion, she always prefaces her answer, Roger's mom, with, now you're asking, right? So that's what we want to do. We want to get in a position where we are, at, we are at getting the client to ask us, I'm sorry, I'm trying to pull up my cheat sheet here. Um, I got, okay. Um, so that's what Seth Godin does. He does permission marketing. Uh, Dan Sullivan is a is a uh, strategic coach out of Chicago. He's been around a long time. Twenty years ago, I got involved in this program. It's, it was a three-year program, and I did it for nine years. Uh, he said he loved slow learners with deep pockets. <laughs> but it was a great program, and he talks about there's four things that make you uh, that are have, you, you have four unique abilities. He also talks about referral things, but four things that make you unique abilities. Number one, he said, if you think of a target and you think of a bullseye like we did a minute ago with Simon Sinek, and the inside of that circle are things that you're unique at. They're really unique to you. When you do them, they juice you up, they give you enthusiasm. People have said, boy, you are really good at that. Then outside that circle are things that you're excellent at. Maybe they don't juice you up as much as unique abilities, but they're still really something that really gives you energy. And the third thing is things that you're competent at. You can do them better than other people, but you really don't enjoy them. They don't make you, you don't work better when you do them. You don't learn more as you do them. And the fourth thing are things you're incompetent at. And so again, if you think of that circle, those three, three concentric, concentric rings, it's a great visual. And what Sullivan says is the problem as we're going, growing up is we're taught to focus on our incompetencies. And he uses Don, uh, Don uh, Rodman, Remember Dennis Rodman? Remember Dennis Rodman with the Spurs? Dennis did one thing, he rebounded. That's all he did. He didn't shoot, he didn't try to take the ball down the court. He basically was a rebounder. And he also uses the example, this is way back when he started a program, he uses the example of Frank Sinatra. And his key line is, Frank Sinatra doesn't move pianos. Frank Sinatra shows up to sing. And if you get to the point where you have people around you who just put you in a position where you can show up to sing, that's an ideal ability at using your unique abilities in the best way. So what are the four, four circles? I'm sorry, who was saying? Okay. Good job. This is a, hold on. <laughs> You know, this, this is one I've read, but this one is, is uh, Seth Godin's book, The Icarus Effect. So it's a great book, and I uh, hope you enjoy that. All right, so now, in, in your business, my business, it's really, really important to get referrals, right? You can think, well, okay, I'm going to get referrals. I'm just going to make my no name known. But I think there's four measurable ways that you can be referable. And the very first thing is show up on time. When you have an appointment, when you have a phone call, show up on time. The second thing you can do is do what you say you're going to do. Follow through. Show up on time, follow through. The third thing is something that's maybe not as, um, as logical as you might think, but to say please and thank you. Rogers has tremendous manners. I love when we go to lunch and he, the waiter brings him a water and he says thank you. That's huge. When I go to lunch with a client, when I go to lunch with a prospective employee, that's what I watch for. Do they say please and do they say thank you? And if you don't think that's important, think about the people that you've referred or people that you've been referred to and whether or not they do that. Just test it. Test the theory and see if it works with the people you're involved with. So the four qualities. Good. Oh, someone just told me about that book last night. <laughs> 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 I'm not going to have coffee, but I was just going to order today. Yeah. Is it good? Gotcha. I can't tell you the ending. Um, no, this is a book that was written by a guy. 
it's <laughs> phenomenal. Jim Whitten, and we've engaged him. He's a Stupid consultant for us. <laughs> He's terrific. He's written, and this book is about, it's called Old School, and it's talking about how we got, we've gotten away with all technology. We've gotten away from doing things the way that when we used to communicate with people. So it's a great book. He's got some good videos. We actually, he speaks to, we have him at a private conference once a month, and uh, he's really been very, very helpful. So I hope you enjoy the book. I'm so excited. Can you repeat the name of the book, please? It's called The Old School. No. It's called The Old School Advantage. Advantage. Yeah. Timeless Tools for Every Generation by J.N. Whitten. Jim Whitten, W-H-I-D-D-O-N. He's a great author. He's in town once in a while, um, but but maybe we'll get him to come by and say hi. Okay. Um, the other thing that I, I wanted to mention to you is that when Sullivan talks about people, and this is so true in my experience, that there are two kinds of people. One that come with batteries included, they give you energy, they don't take it, and those that come with batteries not included, they zap your energy. And you know what I'm talking about. You've been around them and you say, I just feel so exhausted when I leave that person. Vampires. Yeah, it's like vampires. They suck the blood out of you. They suck the energy out of you. They use you to get to the next level. And uh, Rogers and I have a relative who, who is like that. He's a great guy, very enthusiastic, but I, I get away and I'm exhausted when I leave, leave his presence. It's his <laughs> I have two of them, so you still don't know which one it is. Um, the other thing, this, this goes back, this was a study that was done 20 years ago, and it's way out of date, but I just thought it was really interesting to, to, to bring back up again. It's called uh, connectivity addiction, and we all know what that means. And 20 years ago, this was an issue. 20 years ago, they were concerned about it. So it's obviously FOMO, right, fear of missing out. Um, and, but the next bullet point I think is kind of interesting. There's so much information available now to your customers on the Internet. They can find virtually everything that, they, that you know. They can find information, they can find knowledge, they can find everything except for, uh, well, they can, first of all, data, right? 75% of what they're looking for they can get in the form of data. 20% they can get in the form of information. The key 5% that's missing is 1% your wisdom and 4% your knowledge. So 5% of the total comes from what you can bring uniquely to the to their experience, because they can find everything else out there. They can find their homes for sale, they can find the schools and neighborhoods and all that, but if you bring your wisdom and your knowledge to the table, that's what's a tipping point in that relationship. One of the things that I think is really important in sales is we have real, real highs and real lows. And I equate it to a bank account. When you've got a real nice month, you've got a big month, you save, don't spend it all, you save it. I think the same thing happens with your emotions. When you have a real nice case, um, it's real easy to get so excited about it and then forget about it and you have, you, you have a, you know, the dumps the next week or the next month. So one, one definition that I heard of a professional that has stuck with me is that a professional, whether it be a movie star, an actor, an entertainer, tries to maintain a level plateau because they're going to have the same ups and downs. So if you can bank your emotions when you have a great experience and a great sale, and then draw on those feelings and those memories when you have a turnaround that is not so good. And even create a file. I mean, I've created a file of, of people who've written me notes and thanked me for different things. And sometimes I'll go back to that file and I just call it my I love me file. I go back and I read, them, I read the comments. I, I, I go back to the bank of emotions and pull out things that um, are, are important to me and at the same time, the gratitude principle is something that Sullivan talks about. And if you Google him, there's tons of YouTube videos on him. Again, Dan Sullivan, the strategic coach, tons of videos. And one of his concepts is a gratitude principle. And so when you get down and you're feeling low, it's important to focus on what's going right in your life. Is it your health? Is it your relationship with your family? Is it your relationship with your church, your synagogue, your alumni? Whatever it is, just take time to be thankful for things. And and, and again, that's another way you can bank those feelings. And when you're dealing with your clients, you know, oftentimes we hear the example of an experience and the difference between Maxwell House and Starbucks is that Starbucks is an experience. You know, if you get a pure cup of coffee, if you get it from the grower, it's five cents a cup. You go to Starbucks, it's five bucks a cup. 
and everything in between is they're creating an experience for you. So if you can do that, I think Rogers is doing that with this office. I mean, coming to this office is an experience, I would think, in your shoes to come in. It's not just a place to go. You could He could have an executive suite somewhere and just have a bunch of desks lined up. But you've got an experience that he's created when you come in here. You, I'm sure you feel that. We also talk a lot about front stage and backstage in my business. When we have a situation where we've run into issues and problems, whether it be medical problems. I had a situation last week where I submitted an application on a client and I immediately got a decline. And I, I, the people were at the meeting last week in, in Austin and I said, it doesn't make sense. And said, so, well, we've seen this case three times. I said, where have you seen it? And they said, well, we saw such and such. And I said, different guy. And the guy's name was not that common but they immediately rejected the application because they'd seen it three times. And I said, Com so I had to tell them, I said, compare social security numbers, not rocket scientists, you all go back, I had to tell them. So they went back and compared social security numbers and it was, it was two different people. My guy was not one of the first two times I'd seen it. So I don't want my client to know that. I don't want my client to experience that ex with me because that's backstage. I don't want him to lose confidence. We've got those situations all the time. You all have that. You have problems with the title company. You have problems with a lender um, that you're helping to work out because of credit or whatever or the homeowner. Uh, there's just things that you don't want the client to experience front stage. So keep it backstage. Think in those terms. We think about that in our, in our office all the time, front stage, backstage. The other thing that we talk about um, is looking at the at looking at it from the client's perspective. If you're sitting in the client's shoes, what would you be looking at? And how would you be looking at it? Um, and also, importantly, to recognize your backstage support. Again, I think Rogers does a great job. He's got a tremendous backstage, and he I, I've seen him recognize and, and acknowledge them. So as you're doing that, as you're working with people, acknowledge your folks. Once a month, or the first of every month we send out a gift basket to somebody who's been helpful to us the prior month. And it's really to say, well, I'm going to do that occasionally. But the first of every month on our team agenda, it says recognition, who we're going to give recognition to. And it may be an insurance company. It may be a doctor's office who helped us with medical records. Uh, it could be a title company. It could be a homeowner. You just, I mean, there's, if, when you stop and think about it, once a month spending 50 bucks to acknowledge somebody's help is really invaluable. I met with a guy yesterday. I gave him a book two years ago called The Icarus, The Butterfly Effect. Have you all seen that? Ever heard that book, The Butterfly Effect? You've heard the concept that a butterfly flapping his wings into China could end up with creating tornadoes and hurricanes. It's a, it's, it's scientifically exact. It's accurate. It's not just a, a theory. So it, the guy I met with yesterday told me that he gave, he goes to uh, get Baccarat. Is that the right way to say it? Baccarat? The casino game. No, no, the, the, the crystal. Oh, Savarsky? Anyway, Whatever. he gets fancy crystal butterflies and gives them to people with the, with the inscription on what has happened, what the theory is behind the butterfly effect. So what we do has an impact. I mean, you may not see it, but what you're doing is making a ripple effect down the road for, that you may not even notice for years and years. I, I, I have my two cents that I think it's really healthy for y'all to do something once a day. Like we do these like now what platforms where it's like one of us like I'm a realtor now what where like off subject but 12 or 13 years ago a uh, company that is now folded the owner of the company took me to lunch and I was just ignorant and she's like I want to take you to lunch and I was like this is fantastic and then at lunch she was essentially asking me to come join her company. It was very awkward, and I literally, she had a liver omelet at Albernay's. I'll never forget, like, the most awkward 30 minutes of silence. And at the end of the lunch, I was like, might as well get something out of it. And I said, what's your one piece of advice? And her, her company literally went under last year. She said, write a thank you note every single day. I was like, what? I was like, that's your advice? She's like, I've, I've written a thank you note every single day to someone who's helped me at some point along the way. So I went home and I wrote her a thank you note because um, she bought my lunch. And I've done that every single day since, and I think that – and again, like it, it, he's an elephant hunter, which all of us are in a sense, but a lot of what we preach to people that are relatively new or starting over or trying to figure it out is I'm a big volume fan. I think y'all need to get experience with apartment leasing, with commercial sales, with, with everything, which means you're in front of a lot more people than probably his, he is. Like my dad's pitch is he, is, he sells life insurance and estate planning to high net worth individuals. Y'all's pitch is you do real estate. I do real estate people all over the world. So I tell you, that's where part of your mission every single day needs to find, to be able to find somebody that's gonna eventually help you out. For his butterfly effect uh, analogy, mine's just like, no way. So 
for every single day you're planting seeds with these people, and it's amazing to me. Like, raise your hand if you've gotten a thank you note in the past six months. It's like a third of the room, right? And that, that kind of stuff goes a long way. So I, I would go in and really scale it down to where every single day, right, five or six. And not, not only is that your time, you're spending money, you're probably spending a dollar a card, but I think that's really good. And I also play off of it, something that he was talking about with the fruit basket. We had a, a guy come up and talk here a few years ago. And it was probably one of my favorite classes and I was really surprised. A few of y'all might have been in there, but his whole theory was on the golden goose versus the golden egg, right? And it just goes back to the person. The person that introduced you to the person is more valuable to you than the person, right? And so what I found when I was doing high volume sales and, and you know do 30 to 50 transactions a year, I would almost communicate more with the person that referred the deal than the person I was working with. And then my goal with that was to communicate so much with the lead source, which is the golden goose, that eventually they're going to say what? Dude, I referred them to you because you're great. Like, quit calling me about the amendment, right? Or the lead based paint addendum, right? But I just did that because that's my boss. Like, this person is a source, but that to me is very valuable. Where in the, in the past, I used to go opposite approach. So I would hyper, or I would silo that down to every single day, find a handful of people that have helped you that day. And when you send them something, be strategic with it too, which is what we talked about in the now what, send them to their office. Put a handful of business cards in there. I don't know who it was, but someone ordered a thousand business cards and I saw a box. It's genius. If I saw a thousand business cards on my desk, my number one goal would be what? Get rid of them. Get rid of them. So put five or six in each 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 envelope. Worst case scenario, eventually somebody's gonna get on their desk, it's gonna fall open, there's gonna be five business cards on there. What's that blue card? Hey, hey Logan, my friend just called, they're moving here from XYZ. Can you help me find an apartment? No way. That's the kind of stuff that I did early on because most realtors think like this. Y'all have to think like 360 degrees each way. And I think that approach is great, but do it daily. Yeah, I, and I do. We, I have a, a, my planner. I write in the very first thing in my planner every single day, personal note. Every single day because I have to be reminded. It takes three minutes. And every day there's somebody you can send it to. I got a really nice newsletter or a New Year's letter from a client of ours outlining everything he's done this past year with his family. It was really well done. I'm going to write him a note, just thanking him for send, taking the time to send that to me because it was a lot of effort. But when you talk about communication, uh, what I was looking for in Witten's book, and by the way, this is autographed. Oh. Um, what I was looking for in Witten's book. By my dad. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> my secretary does them all. No. <laughs> um, what he talks about is the different ways of communicating with people and the, the worst way, is, as you can imagine, is email, text, then all the way down the list. And a personal note is the best thing, the best way to communicate. Phone call, then personal note. Can I add one thing to that, too? With that being said, I can't tell you how many times I've sent someone a thank you note, and guess what I get like a day later? A text, hey, thank you for the thank you note, <laughs> which opens up conversation again. Yeah. It's crazy because they're so caught off guard. It, it blows them, it kind of blows them away. Witten talks very specifically in his book about how to do that. He talks about the color of the paper. He talks about what to use on the imprint. Uh, he talks about how to use, a, to use a folded card. It's very specific. And then he also talks, and this is more than I can handle, frankly, but he also talks about sealing it with a wax seal on the back. It's a little aggressive. Yeah, so, yeah, so for a little more, little more than, I can, than I do. But I've got notes from his son, who's incredible. He's a property and casualty <coughs> guy with, with Hub. Um, and he has sent me a note and saying he did the same way and he sent me a gift card for Starbucks for 10 bucks for a cup of coffee Thanking me for meeting with him. So it's a great touch. I mean, here's a, the guy's son He actually does what his dad preaches and um, it, So there's some specific ideas in there. He talks about using brown ink. Don't use black ink. Use brown ink. It's softer It's more effective. Uh, it's more effective. He also goes to the point of if he knows somebody was a World War II veteran or they're in the planes he buys postage stamps tied to their Unique interest, and puts a stamp on there. There's a movie that just come out. It just come out. Uh, is it 9/11? 1917. 1917. Thank you. I knew there were numbers in it, nine and a one. Um, but he he talked to somebody about the movie, and they connected on it, and he bought some stamps that were from that era, from World War One. So anyway, just some quick ideas on that. And he licked it and it disintegrated. Yeah, <laughs> it was too old. The stamp was old. He had to use a whole bunch of them. Um, Terry Shodine is a woman who speaks a lot about presentations, and she's a great speaker. I've heard her several times. I heard her again last week, and she talks about the fact that there's two ways that people try to communicate, 
And unfortunately, she said most of it just try to give information. It's just we, we try to dump information on people. And that's not very effective because it gets back to they can get most of that information on the internet, right? They can, get, they can search for themselves. She said what we really need to focus on when we're working with our clients is persuading them. So when you have a conversation, is it informative or is it persuasive? And she identifies what is persuasive to people. So she said the number one thing that you can connect with people is if you can save them time. And this, this applies, I think, to you all just like it does to me. If you can save your customers, your clients, from driving around town for, for a week, that's going to be very valuable to them. The second thing they want to save is money. They also want to protect their mental sanity. Mm. What can you do to help them protect their mental sanity? Um, from neighborhoods to dealing with some of the advisors they're working with. They want greater security. So what you, when you're showing them a home, how can what you do and give them the sense they're going to have greater security? Can they see themselves in that, in that home? They want you to help them make things faster. And really interestingly, they want it to be fun. Again, as I think about Rogers and what he's created over the years, I think those are things that he's done here. To, you know, from what I see, most of the time it's probably a fun environment to be in. Uh, that's important for you to convey that to your clients. Think about your customer. How can you have fun with your customer? What's one way to? I have. Okay, immediately I thought came into my mind. What's what's a way to have fun with your with your customers or clients when you're driving around town? Put on their favorite song. So. Good. Yeah. Good. Ask them what it is. Perfect. Great. What else? People love stories, love stories. How about driving through Dairy Queen or Dairy Bell or McDonald's, get an ice cream cone, you know? <laughs> Completely random, yeah. <laughs> okay, so what are, the, what are the persuasive approach involved? What are, the, what are the key points? Okay. Okay, you're going to have to share this book. Oh. <laughs> That's a great book about conception. The book is called Juggling Elephants. Can you get a mental picture of that? How we can try to balance home life, homework, life work, um, all those things together. Okay, Maya Angelou, you all know the award-winning poet. She said something that's really resonated with me. I try to remember is that people will forget what you said People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. You know, I've got relationships, people that I've met over the years, and I can't remember what we talked about last, but I, I know how they make me feel. There's a friend of mine in Philadelphia, a very close friend of mine, a great guy. We had a conversation a week ago, and I'm not sure exactly what we talked about, but I know how he makes me feel. I told him I can hear him smiling over the phone. I said, your voice smiles when you talk to me. Um, that's just a great way to make an interaction with people. So think about that when you leave an, when you leave an interaction with one of your customers, how do they feel? Uh, oh, the other thing Terry, Terry Shodin says that I think is a great phrase to remember. She says, after you put your spiel together or you put your elevator speech together or you put your marketing piece together, ask yourself, so what? You know, in our firm, we probably have 300 years of experience combined. But if I said that to a customer or a client of ours, so what? What does that mean to me? Well, it means we've seen virtually every possible situation. We've got great planners on our team. But if you exp explain why, if you can answer the so what to your client instead of just making a statement like we've got you know, X amount of experience with our group, what does that mean to them? How does that translate to them? The other thing that we've uh, learned over the years is the idea of um, breaking news to somebody in a, in a slow way. There's a great joke that conveys that concept. Uh, a man keeps his sister's cat while she goes to Europe, and she calls every single day and says, how's my cat? And he says, cat's fine, cat's fine. And every day she calls, and one day the cat is not fine. She calls, and she says, how's my cat? He said, the cat died. She says, what? How could you be so brutal? And just lay it out. Like, she, she, he said, what would you have me do? She said, well, when I call the first day, tell me the cat fell out of the tree. When I call back, say, cat's not doing so well. Third day, you say, cat died. I'm prepared for it. She said, I hope you've learned your lesson. He said, yeah, I got it. She said, how's mom? He said, mom's in the tree. 
<laughs> so the point is, when you've got bad news, don't just lay it out there. We, when we have underwriting issues with clients, I don't call and say, you've been declined. I'll call and say, hey, we've got some new information, and unfortunately, the underwriters aren't looking at it too favorably. We're having to take some different routes, and it's true. I mean, we don't, at that point, we haven't been declined. But I'll build it up gradually and say, well, we've got a little bit better news, and then ultimately say, well, the good news is you're 50 years old on the outside. The bad news is on the inside you're 60 years old. So in just, instead of just telling them how much the rate increase is, we literally run rates at a standard 60-year-old male to show the 50-year-old. Because he doesn't understand table D or table 8 in underwriting. But he understands that, yeah, he gets it. On the inside, I'm 60. On the outside, I'm 50. But we don't do that in one fell swoop. We, you know, we, cat's in the tree. Cat fell out of the tree. So just keep that in mind as you're thinking about having to deal with your clients and with news that may not be so positive. Uh, and then as we wrap up, just some things on, on your elevator speech. Uh, these are pretty standard things. You know, make it short. Be pre-prepared speech that explains what you do, what your organization does clearly and succinctly. Again, as you're doing your elevator speech, ask yourself, so what? It's designed to spark interest, 20 to 30 seconds max, and it's got to be interesting, memorable, and succinct. Stories are great. If, you, you know, if, if there's a way, even in the real estate business, I'm not going to tell you how to make your own speech, but you can, you can expand on we sell homes. You, you can expand on it and make it more personal to your, to your customers. If you were in, if in their seat, if you were sitting in their seat, how would you want to have it presented to you? You know, the golden rule is great, but I twist it a little bit and I say, do unto others as they would have them do unto them. Because we take information in differently. When I meet with a new prospect, I always ask them, how do you like information presented? I'm a visual person, I like graphs, I like visual, but somebody I'm meeting with might want numbers, they might want narratives, they might want you know, executive summary, they may want all the backup. So I was asking, how do you want numbers? How do you want information presented to you as we're working together? So just remember the concept, you know, present, do unto others as they would have you do unto them instead of the other way around. Um, and then so, Seth Godin, we've talked a little bit about. Can we do a little bit more of that elevator pitch? I think in, in the past we've kind of made it a little more interactive. And okay. Yeah. I, I, think that, I think that's so crucial, uh, especially, again, we're kind of in two different arenas, and you guys are all okay. competing with people that, you, you probably can't literally go a, a city block without driving past another realtor. Yeah. And I think that's really important for you guys to have this. And it's kind of uncomfortable to think about it, but maybe if anybody's comfortable wanting to start off with- Who has one? Yeah. Who has an elevator speech? People ask you, what do you do? What do you say? Helping people achieve the American dream through home ownership. Great. What has he done there? It's not about him, right? It's about people. And what are they doing? They're achieving the ultimate dream. Which my first question would be is, so what do you do, right? He, how do you do that? He didn't say what he did. He yeah. didn't say how he did it. He just said he helps people where most people would assume he's what? A realtor or a home builder? And they ask, I said, in the mortgage business, we help change lives one loan at a time. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> that's great. I mean, what you want to do is engage them. You know, if, if I'm at a cocktail party or I'm somewhere where somebody comes up to me on the airplane or whatever, I don't want to get in conversation. What do you do? I'm a life insurance agent. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> End of conversation. I have the rest of the trip or the evening to myself. So, but if it's somebody I want to engage with, we, we talk about what well, we find most people don't continue their planning for three reasons. Would you like to know what they are? So that's permission marketing. The yes, they ask, what, 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 what are the three reasons? And I get into the three, the three C's. Sorry, three C's. Who else? Let me, let me flip it on you all, too. And I think we have an opportunity with what we do. Rarely are people going to be sitting at Starbucks or on an airplane or at church yeah. being like, I really think I'm going to switch insurance. For it's like, no, that's going to be a conversation that you just don't want to have. But we have people that are essentially fishing. They're like, they, they're fish jumping in our boat, right? And the analogy I would go give is if you're at, if you're in a public place and you see someone doing this on their phone, they're literally doing one of two things. One is what? Like a dating app, literally. Or two is what? They're looking at houses. And, and I, or, or, yeah, they're looking, I mean, looking at real estate. I think you guys have to come up with a pitch that you're not in the elevator, right? Which again, and, and she, she's great at this. Like every time I'm in public, I, I cannot not talk to somebody. I was at a bar a few weeks ago and this bartender who was literally, he looked like Santa Claus and literally had a, a sweatshirt on that said the North Pole, which was an invitation for what? 
conversation. Like a conversation. Yeah. And it, throughout the course of the night, I had a few beers and I was sitting there talking to him. And he's like, it's so much more awkward for me not to introduce myself to someone than to introduce myself to someone. I was like, it's so freaking true. But you guys have to realize the sense of urgency of what we do. If I see someone doing this, worst case scenario, they're going to say what? I'm a realtor. Well, great. We're at what city? Denver. Great. I'm in Dallas. Cool opportunity, right? And that's the beauty of Relo is we can literally help anybody anywhere in the world with everything with real estate. So you're gonna to have to find your way to go and approach that person in public, knowing that if you don't go ask them on a date, who's going to? Someone else, right? If you wanna make as much money as you can, you have to have like a little bit of sense of just like you're gonna get punched in the face, right? So I think that that's, that's my question to y'all. Your first is what's your elevator pitch to where, how do you get somebody interested in what you do, knowing that they know at least five other people what you do? That's beneficial to me, because those five people, guess what? They probably don't do a good job. Right, so when you lead with it, like, well, I, I, I'd self-deprecate. And, and I think that a lot of you guys are in a position where you can go and do that, but I got to the point where I'm like, someone's gonna make fun of me, but if I make fun of myself first, what does that take away from them? The power, right? So I always, I, my, I was like, oh, I cannot believe I'm doing this again after 19 years in a row. Um, are you looking at houses? Yeah, <laughs> right, is this your realtor? No, this is my mother. I, my name is Roger Thiele, and like, I'm a realtor, I gotta do this as far. Really, I respect your aggression. Or your, your aggressiveness, right? No way. Worst case scenario, what do I get from those people? Their respect, right? And they're gonna probably say, I already have a realtor. And what's your immediate response to that? You sign an agreement? What do you mean? Well, I'm your new realtor, I'm Rogers. Right, well my realtor is my daughter. Where does she work? <laughs> right? And so I'm just saying that there, there's ways to go and, and work around it to work. And when you put yourself in these situations enough, you get numb to it. And then like part of like my drug, everyone has a different drug in this business. Like I have to have those moments that I'm like about to be uncomfortable. And if I, if I get uncomfortable, it makes me feel alive. It's like a rush. So your first pitch is like literally in an elevator. That's why they call it an elevator pitch. We're on the second floor here. So your 20 second elevator pitch has to be like six seconds. What does that look like? Ready for this? How you doing? How you, how's your day? I'm Rogers. What's your name? Fran. Fran, Where, you work on this floor? Uh-huh. Oh, nice, which, which office? Um, um, Oh, nice. What do you guys in the alphabet business, right? Cool. <laughs> and then what is she forced to ask? What do you do? Where do you work? Where do you work? I work in suite 210. What do you do? I'm in sales. I'm in sales. What kind of sales? I'm in real estate sales. Have a good day. Well, hold on. Right? I recognize Fran, right? Because I've seen her at the office building before. So the next time I'm in the elevator, what's she going to say? You're in suite 210. What kind of sales? I do real estate sales. Right? Crazy. It was a the show back in the day called The Pickup Artist. You guys remember this on VH1? Yes. Oh, my God. The most ridiculous show ever, but it was fascinating. It was this guy named Mystery, who was this like six foot eight, weird Al Yankovic looking nerd that had a theory on literally if any guy could look, like go pick up any girl at a bar with these different little techniques. And one was a thing called negging. You guys remember this? Where it's like you kind of got to get him interested, but his very first thing was peacocking. Where if you go to, what does a peacock do when they get in, in, in when they're in trouble? <laughs> Colorful, like, ooh, wow, right? But his thing with negging was like, you kind of get him interested, and then what do you do? walk away in the world of sales guys that's so crucial and that show is so terrible but there's so many good points and it's where your elevator pitch has to be something to where you stand out against 59,999 other people to do what you do in this city and residential alone so who wants to give an elevator pitch real quick nobody okay then you're gonna get crushed you're gonna get crushed I'm if you can't practice it here Seriously, you don't want so to practice awkward, in like, front of cares? a prospect. These, these aren't your best friends. This is your competition. Everyone in here cares about you, but at the end of the day, if you're not going and crushing the person next to you, you deserve to get your freaking butt crushed. I say that with respect and love. <laughs> but seriously, who wants to give an elevator pitch? How hey, you that's doing? That's a nice suit. I'm Matt Harris. Where'd you get it? Oh, Tokyo. It's got a guy. I mean, I've only, I can only wear it twice, but why? Golly, Tokyo. I've never been before. Do you? I haven't been either. So, so think about it as you're asking questions. It's just conversation. I, that's it. Yeah, but the key to that conversation when Rogers asked Fran, you know, where she works, he didn't say, Do you work in this building? You know, we get cut off so many times by asking close ended questions. You know, is that suit new? Yes. Instead of where'd you get that suit? Right. W questions. Yeah, W questions. What, where, when? What are, what, are, what are they doing? I mean, what I was looking for in, book, in Witten's book, he's got a lava concept. It's lava. You want a warm, glowing conversation. And the L stands for location. You know, when you ask people, are you new to town? Did you just get here? Are, where are you from? Uh, who do you know at this association meeting, if you're at a meeting? 
And then the A is avocation. What do you do with your free time? Instead of saying, what do you do? What do we ask people, what do you do? I'm, I'm getting get into the real estate uh, spiel. But if, if you, on the asking question side of it, ask them, what are you doing in your free time? Then that leads to, you know, w when you're not doing that, what do you do? That leads to a discussion about their vocation. And then beyond that, you can ask them about their avocation. So location, association, uh, vocation, and, and I mean, yeah, location, avocation, vocation, and association. Those, those orders are not important. But that's the key is, just remember, warm, glowing conversation, lava. And, and I would practice, too, like how you ask them the question. That, that, like what you're asking them is the same question everyone else is asking, but it's the way that you ask. Right? The worst question is, what do you do? Yeah. Oh. Right? It's like yeah. if y'all were in a fraternity in college, like you do these things called rush rounds. Where literally you go around, and it's like, have you seen Animal House? Like, hey, Eric Stratton, damn glad to meet you. It's like, yeah. what do you do? That's how I feel. And it would drive me crazy, right? So, like, what do you do during the daytime, right? It like throws them off. And I was at my high school reunion, last story I'll tell, I'll, I'll, I'll give you back the mic. My high school reunion, we were, it's just like this, it's just awkward, right? There's 500 people there you haven't talked to in 20 years, dot, 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 for a reason. So, the question is, how are you doing? What do you do for work, blah, blah, blah. This one guy came up to me who's an appraiser, believe it or not, and he said, hey, man, Preston, like Rogers, he's like, what are you asking Santa for for Christmas? And I was just like, what? <laughs> and I was so thrown off. We're like, I literally had the longest conversation of the night with a guy whose wife I took to prom. It would never be nice to me, literally. But I just enjoyed the fact that he was ready. He was so ready because he knew the rest of the room was going to ask me about one thing, which was what? what you Work. Yeah. Hey, man, it's like, come on. I don't want to talk about real estate at my high school reunion. I want to talk about, like, like you lost all your hair. And, like, mine's growing. Right, so there's, there's just ways to go and do it to where y'all need to have two different elevator pitches. Like yours is perfect. My name is Rogers Healy. I help all my friends all over the world with all their real estate and moving needs. I would never say that to somebody, ever, ever, ever. ever. But I can put it on my Instagram, which means the people that I meet in the elevator eventually, what are they going to do? They're going to follow me online, right? To where I can let the words do the talking. Get them interested. And I think still to this day, some of the best advice this office has ever been given was by Gigi. Five years ago on a panel. We all close it out with the best advice, and she said, be interested, not interesting. And if you send someone a thank you note, they're probably going to feel what? Like they owe you something. Right? Make the first move and kind of retreat. Please. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing I want to mention, there's, there's a book called Crucial Conversations that I've read that's really, really, it's, it's really impactful helps you guide through conversation you've got to have if it's going to be emotionally charged and expensively, potentially expensive. Another one called We Need to Talk. Um, who thinks they could benefit from this book? All right, let me make sure. I'm you not going to say no. I, 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 I have my like collection. Yeah, she got a library right there. Yeah, here you go. Well, I, no, I'm oh, sorry. No. She got <laughs> That's right. You need to ask, right? All, all, I, can say, all I can say is no. Um, Anyway, the, the other thing I want to mention, I, I just listened to this book. I, I heard this woman on NPR last week. Her name is Victoria Turk. She's British, and she was doing an NPR talk on emails. And it was really fascinating. She had some really good email etiquette. And she was talking about uh, different, she's got actually in a book there's a schematic about when you send an email and when you make a phone call. And I was really intrigued by her interview on the, on the, on the uh, show, so I bought some of her books. And I listened to it this weekend and read it. And uh, I was, frankly, disappointed in the last half of it. The first part is good. The second half may have application because she talks about dating apps. She talks about Facebook. She talks about how to put yourself out there in your age group, not mine. And uh, one of the things that she talked about is emails. And the title of the book is Kill, Reply All. I got an email yesterday from a guy who's presenting at a meeting I'm going to this weekend. And he sent it to every participant in the meeting, individually. So guess what happened yesterday? I started getting reply alls from people who were, great, looking forward to seeing you. You know, and I thought, oh my gosh. It's, so I, I responded to one of the guys, and I realized I was responding to one of the responses. Then I went back to the source. But anyway, great. who, who was interested in more email information? Suggestion with that, when you get an email where there's a thousand other emails on there, you know what you should do with those other emails? Save them. and paste them yeah. and add them to your database. I'm dead serious. Yeah. Like that's somebody's database. If they go and put 500 people on there as a CC, copy and add them to your database. Constant contact, conversion, any kind of CRM, that is now a potential opportunity for you to go inform them about what you do. 
Yeah, except in this case, they're all insurance agents, so. Whatever. They don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Give me the data. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, a couple of quick things as we're wrapping up. The uh, Five Second Rule is a, a book by a woman named Mel Robbins. And Mel Robbins now has her own TV show. How many are familiar with her? Have you seen her stuff? Okay, great. The book is, came about because she and her husband were going through a rough time financially. Mm -hmm. She was doing a little bit too much drinking. They were having a rough relationship between the two of them. And she was, she, after a couple, three drinks, she was going to bed and she happened to turn on the TV and see a, a rocket blast off. And what happens right before a rocket blast off? What do they do? Count down. Count down. 10, 9, 8. So she created this book and this concept called the five second rule based on, okay, I'm not going to count to five and do something. I'm going to start at five and count down. And I used it this morning getting out of bed. I did not, at four o'clock, I did not want to get up. I said, five, four, three, two, one, blast off. And, you, pardon me? She's got a lot of TED Talk. A lot of TED and her show, is, I don't like, I've seen her show a couple times, but the book is great. Just, just the concept of five, four, three, two, one. So when you're up against a, a deadline, when you're up against something you really don't want to do, just use the five, four, three, two, one, make the call. Five, four, three, two, one, send the text. Five, four, three, two, one, send an email. Just do it. Get up and do it. So, uh, I share real quick maybe what changed, and don't mention the details, but mm -hmm. how we were kind of having a little moment. I think you'll appreciate this, and y'all will too. And I truly, and this was probably five months ago, That's six months ago, it changed your entire trajectory of your career. Please, for sure. So, the day I got hired, Rogers asked me the terrible question of who I'm most scared to call. And I gave him a name, pulled up the name, and 54321. I was calling that person, and it changed not only my career, but really my life, how I kind of view those hurdles. And Terrific rest yeah. yeah. And it just kind of came to fruition. But I think y'all got to do that. It's like awkward, right? And yeah. I was, I'm sweating again just because you made these things. But you're still, but like literally, it's a multi-billion, yeah. the guy's a multi-billionaire, and now you're in talks of doing what? Yeah, relocating. Yeah, so whatever. Mike, uh, when we were in, we used to live in Corpus Christi, and there was a, a man down there who's now deceased, but he was a king ranch heir, chairman of the board of, one of, the, of the biggest bank in Corpus Christi at the time. And um, I, I, I called on him, and I was a young agent. I was maybe 28, 29, and I called on him, and I got in front of him, did business with him, did business with his wife, who was also very wealthy. And um, my wife called it the prettiest girl in school theory. The prettiest girl in school often sits home the night of the prom because everybody figures, okay. what? She's got a date. And that's the way with people like you that you called on. I mean, every, they've got such great gatekeepers, but guess what? Nobody, if you get past the gatekeepers, then you're likely to do business with them. What we find is when you talk about referrals, Rogers, you were talking about referrals earlier. Uh, when we get a referral from an attorney or a CPA, we say, that attorney or CPA, our job is to make them look better than they did before by what we're going to do for them, for their client. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, finally, free to focus, uh, a guy named Michael Hyatt has written a book, and it's, uh, it's a really, really, I really encourage you. I bought his planner. I, I, he does a lot of videos, and a lot of these are an incredible marketer, too much marketing. But free to focus is, is the idea that take time to focus on things, really get clear on what you want to accomplish and, and get after it. He talks about the fact that uh, Sullivan uses the idea of, of free days, focus days, and buffer days. And free, uh, Dan Sullivan in his presentation, he talks about free days. Those are days where you don't do anything work related. No emails, you don't read any business journals, you don't do anything having to do with your business. Then you have focus days that are days where you spend 80% of your time on your unique ability. And you all know what your unique abilities are. I mean, as I've said it, you've already identified in your mind what they are. So 80% of your day, you're focused on unique abilities. And then the buffer days are days where you're preparing for your unique ability days. So free days, focus days, buffer days. What, what um, Hyatt calls them, he calls it front stage, which are what he refers to as your unique ability days. Then he calls it backstage, bless you, backstage where you're preparing for that. And then what do you think the third, is it the fir, third stage is that where you're disengaged and you're having free days? What is it? Well, perfect. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So it's, it's, I like it better. I like it better than Sullivan's because it's so much easier to relate to front stage, backstage, and off stage. So off stage, you're disengaged. So, yeah. Um, okay. Bob, Bob Bodine, this is a great story. I heard this guy speak, and I got really engaged in it. And, I was, and his whole point is you already know everybody you need to know. Build your network. You already know them. You know, just go through, like LinkedIn is a great example. He wrote this, I'm sure, before LinkedIn became so popular. But um, his, his point is you already know everybody you need to know. Make, connect the dots. And I was having lunch with a friend of mine, and I was telling him about this book. And I, I told him what the principle was. And he said, Bob Bodine? He said, I helped edit the book. I said, what? He said, yeah. He said, Bodine's here in Dallas. You want to meet him? So we had lunch together. And subsequently, me? Yeah. Story? OK, again, I'm not a book reader. My dad's talking about this guy, Bob Odeen, so I went and had lunch with him, too, and now he's a close friend. But um, the, his whole, the whole premise of his book, I think, is something that's really crucial for y'all. And it kind of reminds me of the first day that you kind of, it kind of clicked with you. If y'all don't know Selden, he's been up here for, for a, 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 that's Selden, for a long day, a long time. But he, he, was, he was one of the reasons that we kind of built the Now What program because he was hungry. He just kind of didn't know what to do at the very beginning. And kind of as a guinea pig, I just said, go to the conference room and call everybody in your phone book. And he's like, well, what do I say? Well, essentially say you're a realtor, right? So like literally three days later, he comes back and he's like, okay, I, I mean, called him. eight everybody. hours a day. Literally, like not, 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 not being obnoxious. And he said, okay, I did it, now what? I was like, call him again, right? And like two weeks later, he's like, okay, someone wants to see an apartment. It's like, you do that because he already had a database. There's 100 people or 1,000 people where a lot, my, a lot of my obsession at the beginning was like, I wanted to know everybody. It's impossible, right? What I want at this point in my life is I want everybody to know me, and that all starts with the people you already have in your database. So Bob Bodine's theory is you, like you pick your 10, your five, your 10 most influential people, and that's who you focus on. And in the world of sales, the people that are already part of your life prior to getting a license or insurance or whatever, they care about you for you, which means those are your foot soldiers. Or at the beginning of my career, what I wanted to do is like I wanted to be like this luxury high net. It's like impossible. Doesn't matter like how much, you, especially if you're young, right? Some of us are very young, but some of us are in our. I was 21. Like a 55 year old worth a billion dollars that I have no connection to probably is not going to answer my phone call. Maybe at the first few years, I should have focused on the people that were probably his like nephew, where eventually I would have met him at a party, and then we had an organic introduction. That's the whole theme of this book, and it's. I still haven't read it, but it, it's. <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I mean, like, I, but I, that's how I, that's how I live, right? And then you get to the point where some of us, like, like Macaulay and myself, are just so robotic that if I want to get to somebody in my head, I can go and be like, all right, great. You guys know the whole uh, six degrees of Kevin Bacon? You don't know what this is. There's a, a game or a theory that Kevin Bacon is six degrees or less away from anybody in the world. I don't know why Kevin Bacon was the the person behind this. Like, you guys can all be the same way. Right, and I want to go and be the person that can be the connector to X Y Z person, but I want them to answer my phone because at one point before I call them and essentially ask for a favor, what did I do for them? A favor, right? Like you never want someone to owe you lunch, or I I don't want to ever owe anybody lunch. And I think that's the whole theory of this book is that you know who you need to know, and they already know they already know you. Great, great story. And so, so tell me, what, would you like that? Oh yeah, you got it. Good. Who would you recommend I give it to? Colin. Colin. Oh, Colin, awesome. Oh, man. You go, Colin. Um, when, when we lived in San Antonio, um, I've done a lot of work with Whataburger over the years, and I, and I knew the, exec, the director of the Phoenix area, and Rogers was enamored with Charles Barkley. We had a dog we named Barkley for Charles Barkley. And so I introduced Rogers to, to this guy, Paul, and I said, Rogers, Paul knows. I was a kid. First How old were you, 11? 11. 11 years old. So I said, Rogers, Paul knows Charles Barkley. Like that, Roger says, does Charles Barkley know you? I thought that was a great deal. And so your idea of, you know, don't know everybody, have everybody know you, make yourself a light on the hill where the light shines and they see you instead of trying to find and all. And it goes back to the elevator yeah. pitch, right? I think that if one thing you need to leave people with is a memory, right? I, for me, my biggest asset for that is my name is weird. Right, so like my name is Rogers. Roger, it's Rogers. It's Rod. It's Rock. They remember that. Bye. <laughs> right. See you on the next. It's like you have to find a way to go and do that to where your unique sales pitch is you, 
And I think going back to what you were saying about the four things where like the fourth thing or fifth thing when you're with somebody is fun, you gotta find a way to disconnect from real estate. Okay, because there's gonna be something that none of us know, whether it's me, whether it's you, in the world of real estate. Okay, and the kiss of death is being like, I don't know, or giving the wrong information. But if they fall in love with you, at the end of the day, our business is a popularity business. The most popular people have the most opportunity, the most educated people get the most referrals. Period. Okay, but you have to find a way to connect with these guys, which again is awkward, right? And something that you need to learn too is there's some people you don't have to work with. Right? And if I could go back and think about the amount of relationships I had that I was like, I can't stand this person, but I'm just gonna see it through to make 3%, where I could have just been like, not a fit. I'm gonna pass and I'm gonna focus on people that I actually wanna talk to. That's really, really hard to master and I'm still not there yet, but I would focus on that because if you do that, you become real, right? And especially when you guys are in that echelon of like working people selling their third home, their first three or four realtors, they probably didn't want, probably didn't like. And then they're gonna be like, well, I didn't know there's other options. I'm like, no, man, like there's everyone else and then there's us. Like I'm gonna make 3% because you like me. I'm gonna close the deal because I know what I'm doing. You gotta find a way to go do that. And it's really, really hard, but it really just revolves around being yourself and being comfortable. Your, your, your personality and your relationship will get you in the door, but your knowledge will keep you in the door. And when you're talking to people, as Roger said, they've all had experiences. So instead of asking them, have you ever dealt with a realtor? When I talk to an attorney or CPA and I'm trying to get referrals from them, I know they know other life insurance agents. So I say, what's been your best experience in dealing with a life insurance agent? Well, I haven't really had one. Well, what's your worst experience? So what are they doing? They're giving me my report card. They're going to tell me how they're going to measure me. So when you're talking with your clients and customers, what was the last experience you had with a real estate agent? How was it? What happened during that interaction that you felt good about? What happened that you didn't feel good about? How would you have changed it if you could go back and change it? So those kinds of things, again, open-ended questions. You're not asking them, did they have a real estate agent? Yes, and where do you go with that? You know, just try to keep it open-ended. So, unless there's questions. Any questions from y'all? It's kind of like your five, four, three, two, one thing. Yeah. People can overthink it when they're younger about making calls and doing it. Yeah. Uh, I had a three, two, one moment when I was 19. I was on an airplane with Hulk Hogan, and I was scared to get his autograph. I told myself, three, two, one, go ask, and I did it. Good for you. <laughs> That's what launched his career. Yeah. So yours was the phone call. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And if he hadn't, and if he hadn't, so what? So Rogers, Rogers and I work out with different trainers, obviously. Of it. This morning we work out, and I got my trainer. Barat's wife is right in front of you. My trainer's wife. Is yes, but you, but he, Barat, I, I asked him this morning, did you quit working out while you were gone? I mean, he's like this. <laughs> But what I got my trainer to do is, instead of doing 12 reps, one, two, three, where I don't know if he's gonna go to 15, I finally taught him to count backwards, 12, 11. And he does it, it makes a big difference when you know there's an end in sight, and is he gonna to go to 20 or is he gonna stop at 12? I that with a 90 second twin. Yeah, yeah, same thing, <laughs> set, set it in reverse. 90 seconds, go you, go girl. Do you set it at 90 and go backwards? In my mind. That's smart. A lot of yeah. yeah. Would you like to show us up here on the yeah. counter? <laughs> it's obvious. A, lot okay. of this is, a lot of this is mental, right? And, and the quicker you guys go and just like master the fact that like you're gonna get your butt handed to you, you're gonna lose. The more fun it, the more fun it is. And I promise you, you, you miss, you kind of miss eventually. Like the like, when you know you're gonna get it, right? It's kind of less fun. It, like I hate to say that. Like when you know that it's so scripted, and you've done it long enough. You walk in, you're like, I can literally go and do this in my sleep, hanging upside down after 25 beers. It like it's not as much fun, right? But when you go master along the way, that's the fun part about this stuff, and that's what he's done better than anybody I've ever met. So what are we gonna say? Well, I was gonna use a very inappropriate analogy. Do it. No. <laughs> my yeah. Well, like, well, like like when you're dating. You know, I mean, dating is an example of. Of the challenge is sometimes is getting the date the first to go out and um, but anyway that, that's that's a that's a great point. The other thing is you're going to be uncomfortable doing that. You're going to be uncomfortable in a position where you're making that phone call, but you got to ask yourself, am I more uncomfortable making that phone call with possible results than I am not making it with no revenue? Right. At the, the end of the day, the it's, either one's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. The longer you wait to make the phone call, the worse you're going to be too. Yeah. If you just do it. Like whatever, and you guys all, you're gonna all learn how to deal with things on the fly. Like it, it, it's just like, that's, it's fun. Life is improv, sales is improv, okay? Um, thank you. Yeah.
Thank awesome. you all. Appreciate Thanks, the attention. Before y'all all leave, I, I, I would love, we do this every year, to get everybody together. I know Chandler's right over here. We're going to take a, a, a group picture. Um, and then, is there one more book, too? That's right. I, I've, ri I've, written it. I've written it. Oh, do you like have notes in there? Yeah, sorry. Okay, cool. Who wants to give an elevator pitch real quick? Come on, go for it, please. Um, are you from around here? Or like, hey, how are you? Yeah, how are you doing? Great, how, how are you? you? Great. Have you been in Texas your whole life? Um, technically, no. I live in L.A. I don't know if you watch See, movies, but how can I was in a movie called Glory Road, and I was an extra. So now I'm a part of the So we, if, that same question, but instead of saying, have you been in Texas all your life, what's another way of saying it that's open-ended? What brought you to Texas? Or how long have you been here? If you just get in your mind, get rid of the yes or no questions, because if, if they answer yes, then where do you go with that? You can say how long, but it's just easier if you keep thinking about open-ended. Well, there's a question yeah. for you actually from online. You deal with rejection. Face the camera, if you don't mind. You deal with you deal with rejection in this industry, and uh, and when do you know how to when do you know how to handle it? Have you been rejected before, and a client has called you back later to work with you? That's a really good question. We're going through that right now. In fact, the case I used the example about the guy with the same name as a tooth that that happened. We we uh, ran into some issues. We didn't do business. Uh, Earlier this month, his secretary texted me and said, would you please call him? He wants to visit with you. So we got the application going again. So yeah, I mean, you don't, you don't ever, ever, ever burn a bridge. My dad used to say, always treat people as though you might work for them someday. So no matter what, you don't, as you said earlier, you don't want them to get down. You don't want to have them take you down to their level. It's your choice, not theirs. So and the other thing, when I have a situation like that, I, I tend to dwell on it. I take it personally. And what I've learned to do, instead of look back, look ahead. You know, I can think ahead, what's going to happen tomorrow, not what happened yesterday. It, it's so easy to get hung up on the past. And, and Sullivan talks about the horizon. He talks about when you're, when, you're, when you're driving to the horizon, what happens? It gets out there, doesn't it? As you drive, the horizon gets farther and farther away. So you never, if your goal is to get to the horizon, you'll never get there. But you need to have that as your goal and your direction. To, so you know where you are and measure where you are. But you need to look back occasionally, too, and say, look where I came from. Look what I've accomplished. So even when you get rejected, it's the idea of that's one person. There was a great article in the Wall Street Journal about a month ago talking about positivity. And it said that it takes four good things to happen to overcome one bad thing. We dwell so much on the one negative thing that it takes four good things. We had, a, we had the best year we've ever had last year. What did I focus on? The one we didn't get. Instead of saying, hey, realistic, we're not going to get them all. You know, um, anyway, so does that answer? Well, the other thing, too, maybe we can throw.